Okay, so now we're going to get into some of the basic tests that we will do on, on components. Now, the particular tests that we perform are going to be uh, based not only on the components specifically, but also the application is being used in and the overall goal for, for your preventive maintenance program. Now, from the most basic aspect, here's kind of, th this table basically gives us an idea of what tests we should be doing. And again, just from, basic as from the most basic aspect. Um, so what you can see here is that with the, uh, an engine, we're going to do basically elemental analysis, viscosity, water, and oxidation test. With hydraulics, because of their particular application, they require a little bit, a couple of different tests because of their performance requirements. So with hydraulics, we add on a particle count. And what a particle count tells us is how clean that fluid is. So when we're comparing hydraulics to an engine, hydraulics typically have clearances that are a lot tighter than an engine, so they need fluid that is a lot cleaner just to maintain their integrity and functionality. Now gearboxes have the same basic test package, but they do not necessarily require a particle count because gearboxes, as a function of what they are, tend to run a lot dirtier so we don't necessarily need to know about the particles that are hanging out so much as we need to know more about the wear metals. Compressors, same basic thing that we would require for the hydraulics for the basic reasons that tighter clearances, higher cleanliness requirements, and the same applies to turbines as well. So now we're going to talk about specifically what these different tests are for the most basic aspect. Now we're talking about elemental analysis. Uh, we, tend to, we use a spectrometer. In fact, we use an inductively coupled plasma spectrometer, which uh, gives us a range of 24 different metal elements that we will categorize by what they typically are. Um, and as you, you can see with, in this chart, between iron, chrome, the nickel, aluminum, all the way over here to vanadium, those are typically considered wear metals. Then we have three elements, the silicon, the sodium, and the potassium, that are typically contaminants. We have our multi-sourced elements, the molybdenum, antimony, manganesium, the lithium, and boron. And then we have our additive elements, which is the magnesium, the calcium, barium, phosphorus, and zinc. We look for combinations of these types of elements to determine what exactly is going on. When we perform this test, what basically happens is um, the oil sample is introduced through a sipper tube that is then basically irradiated and vaporized, and then we're measuring the wavelengths of light or the colors that are emitted through this vaporization. And from there, we're measuring the, the, con the light concentration itself to determine specifically how much of that element is present within the fluid. So basically, we're getting indication of that wide range of elements. They're categorized by what type of element they are, whether, again, they're a wear metal, a multi-source, an additive, or a contaminant. The next test that is most common and is the, the, the most necessary test is the viscosity as far as the lubricant component. Uh, again, the lubricant selection in general begins with the viscosity calculation. So you always want to make sure that your viscosity is within grade so that it can continue to be used. The test we use measures the uh, fluid's resistance to flow under gravity. And it's relative to the fluid's density or the thickness and it affects the fluid's ability to lubricate under different operating conditions. So basically what happens is we in, we're using a capillary tube, which is what you see here on the right, that picture. We have oil that's, we put it there into the capillary tube. We allow it to drain by gravity. Once it hits the, the first point, we start timing it. We time it up until it hits the second point. And then that time is used to calculate the current viscosity. Typically, you want your viscosity to stay within plus or minus 10% of what it should be, and that's going to be based on the different uh, standards that, um, it, that are established to um, make those specifications for the viscosity. So if you're running an ISO 150, you're going to want that viscosity result to be plus or minus 15 um, to make sure that that, that fluid's in, in, in spec. If you exceed that plus or minus 15, you start getting into a whole new range of um, viscosity identification. So 
at that point, your lubricant's not really in spec anymore. And what we're measuring specifically is the kinematic viscosity, which is what we're measuring with gravity. And again, it's performed capillary tube viscometer. That's what we utilize. And it's the fluid's viscosity. And it's, it's assumed to be um, shear rate independent. And all the shear rate is, it's the um, internal flow of the, the fluid and how it thins out or thickens up as it's being used for the most part. What we have, I have there are some, a couple calculations, you know, if you wanted to be able to convert back and forth between kinematic and absolute, those are just some more, just some information that's available to you right now. Of course, another test that we perform is, is the water test, and we have a couple different methods that we utilize. One is what we call the crackle test, and basically what we have is a hot plate, it's heated up, we throw some oil on it, and we actually listen to hear it crackle or to hear the bubbling up of any water that might be trapped in that oil. It's a subjective test because you know you're relying on the person's ability to hear the crackling, but you can typically make that identification of whether it has water up to about half percent, but it is an estimated amount. This particular method is really good for gearboxes or for, for applications where having water is it's a need to know thing, but it's not necessarily specific enough where you need the exact amount. Uh, when you get to the point where you need exact amounts, that's when we get into what's called the Carl Fisher method. And we use the method um, ASTM 1744 to do this calculation. Now this is uh, what you would want to use method-wise when you're talking about turbines or compressors or hydraulics, and for some gear oils depending on that specific application. And it's reported in percent or parts per million. It really depends, you know, which lab you're using or how you want to see the results. But it's a, a, a very exact test, and you use it for applications where you need to make sure that you have a very, very low amount of water, and you need an exact count when you do it. And there's a couple other methods that are utilized. It includes FTIR, which is the Ferro Transformer Infrared Technology. It's fairly accurate, unless there's some other contamination taking place say that there's some glycol or sodium, but it can be uh, slightly expensive. It just depends on what your overall goals are. Uh, distillation is another method. It's also a very good test, but it's usually cost prohibitive as far as something to be done on a regular basis. Now, when we're talking about the water percent by volume, um, you know, I mentioned the Carl Fisher test. Again, this is going to be the most common test you know, that you're going to have as far as getting exact measurements. And basically what happens, this test is done through titration. And all that means is that a, a titrant is added to the sample, and we wait for a chemical reaction to occur. Once that chemical reaction is completed, we're going to look at the amount of titrant that was required to complete that reaction. That volume of titrant is then uh, used for a calculation to come up with the percent of water that is in that fluid. Now, again, some things can't can interfere with that as far as the oil component if in some cases some of the anti-wear additives kind of, it's just kind of dependent and sometimes the mercaptan type of sulfur. These can cause an artificially high result but as long as you're aware of it you can account for that ahead of time. And here's kind of a picture of what that test looks like. So basically um, while stirring the titrant is added in, it's chemically reacted with the water. Um, when the endpoint of the chemical reaction is reached, the amount of titrant used is converted to the result um, to make that determination. So those are some of the basic tests that was the viscosity, the wear metals, and uh, the water.